Okay, so first of all, I want to say thanks a lot for coming on. Uh, you you are one of those like I, I hate saying legend, but it's kind of like legend. Guys like you who are humble and uh, you know hard charger that they kind of shy away from terms like that or like labels. But to me, that's what I think of when I think of you, especially in the jump community. You've been like instrumental in um, you know leading the way in in the jump community for tech bees. And I, I just want to say thanks for coming on, and I, I appreciate it. Hey, I appreciate being here. Thanks. Yeah, so let's start off with what got you in the military and then uh, talk about like maybe tech school because you were, you were in kind of in the early days. We were just talking before we got on that it was a little different back then and you guys were kind of doing some things that were above and beyond what the normal things were doing. So yeah, so go ahead and uh, let me know what got you in the military, what, what uh, prompted that, and then we'll just go from there. All right. Well, I appreciate being here and nice to meet you. You know, I grew up in a small town in central Florida called Chiefland. It was a farming community. It was where my family was from, my mother's side of the family. My dad was in the Air Force and was a, a crew chief on B-52s and C-97s. Oh, okay. And we moved to Chiefland when I was in third grade because he deployed to Thailand for a year and a half during Vietnam. Came back and then he retired like three years later and I ended up growing up in that town and and the good thing, it was before there were year-round sports and club teams. If you had two legs and you could walk, you could walk onto any athletic team and they'd keep you because they needed, you know, boys and young men. Sure. And so I played basketball, football, track, baseball until they learned to throw a curveball. And then I jumped over to tennis. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't handle the curveball. And didn't really know what I wanted to do. I worked in farming, watermelons, hay, tobacco. Uh, so, I'd, you know, our summer weight training program was throwing watermelons, you know, eight, 10 hours a day. And I was going to go into banking. I actually got recruited, recruited to leave school a half a year early and uh, go to the local bank. It was a big deal. But I had a lady teach me a class and it was something in banking. And she said, you're too young. I've been doing this 35 years. Please leave and go do something else <laughs> and then come back to banking if you want to. All right. And um, I went to a recruiter and I found a letter just like I was talking to you before we started recording. I found a letter from my mom that it was at my retirement and she wrote a letter that said, I remember being in Ocala at a conference and you called me and your dad and said you had just enlisted in the Air Force. And then she wrote Romad in the the letter. And that's what I have. I had a delayed enlistment printout on one of those dot matrix printers that said sure. Romad, radio operator, maintenance, and driver. <laughs> and uh, But in that description, it said you could possibly go to jump school. And I thought, well, that's pretty cool. I didn't yeah. know, had, had no experience with parachuting or the airborne community, but it sounded cool. So I signed up in june of 77 so it had to be within a couple weeks after they created the career field and it got fed out um and then i reported in january and i just wanted to get out of my small town and and go see some places and do some things and that's how i got in nice uh, if you were you're were right back then you would go to basic basic to keesler after Keesler, they gave you a set of blanket orders that sent you to Fairchild and then sent you to Romad School at Hurlburt. And then in my case and one other of my classmates sent us to Benning. And then from Benning, I went direct to Bragg. Okay. Uh, so that's how that all started out. Combat control was kind of ahead of us. When I got to Keesler, they gave me, I was waiting, you know, three to five weeks for a course to start. And they said, you can do details, you know, mopping and mowing and picking up trash, or you can do PT twice a day with combat control. So I had like a month of two a days of pretty good workout. And, you know, when you're 18 years old and you've got money for beer and all you're having <laughs> to do is work out and drink and eat, it was, it was a heavenly time. I was going to say, it sounds pretty nice. And that started that journey. <laughs> oh, cool. Your, you said your first time was Fort Bragg. Was it, it wasn't, they didn't have ASOSs back then. It was like, what, what, what were you guys it called back then? One five oh seventh TAC Air Control Wing. It was, okay. uh, we were housed in a Army motor pool. Um, and it seemed like every time we fixed up a facility, and I think you probably saw that in your whole career, that the Army would mysteriously say, hey, it's time for you guys <laughs> to move somewhere else. And then yep, take yep. it over. 
<laughs> uh, there's some legends there that was, you know, Chief Fiscus, uh, Chief Suarez, Sorry Suarez was the chief who helped stand up the career field and was our, the TAC representative. Um, you know, Jim Brock. Uh, and then this, I think you know the whole community that spawned out of that debt. Yeah. It became the 14th ASOS later, but everybody from uh, Lunk to Mark Valella to Kenny Lindsay, Tim Stamey. Yeah. All the people that you've you mentioned earlier, it was just a group that really fanned out. And back then we only had one chief and then we had two. Um, and what people don't know is Chief Fiscus and Joe Walks went to jump school together in 1959. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> so when I was out at his funeral to find out all of that, you just don't know it when you're there. You know, remember when you were an airman, you thought a staff sergeant was old, and now you know that he was probably only four years older than you. Right. Um, but the fact that I was born in 59, and that's when they went to jump school, it was just pretty pretty good. And I was self-aware of like Howard McNeil, Jim Brock, Joe Walks, Jack Hogan, all those guys were – they had the presence to hold you accountable for discipline and to do what your job was well, but they also had the wherewithal to let you just run friggin' wild on yeah. the side. I mean, I don't think we would have survived the military of today with the oh. things that we did. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but good times. So that's how yeah. I ended up at Bragg, and it, it was debt one, then it became the 14th. Okay. I was only at Bragg, I was assigned you near know, second brigade. Um, had a battalion for a while, but basically we used to pull at the brigade and then go to whichever battalion needed, you know, needed support. Right. It was a different time. We were fighting our way into that, right? Nobody really wanted you around. You had ALOs who were just pissed. This was barely post Vietnam. So, you know, if, if they came to become an ALO, it's either because they were promised they'd get the fighter they wanted when they left, or they were just in trouble and their career was basically over. Yeah, uh, yeah, had both kinds. I was only there for three years. Uh, loved it. Good times. A number of the people who were in the first class were at Bragg, like Gene Chan, Gary Chance. They were the very first class. They were at Bragg. Um, and then I went to the schoolhouse. So my career ends up being a, a journey of what's next. It wasn't a, hey, I'm going to stay in 20 years. It's like I was at Fort Bragg, loved it, jumping out of planes. Uh, Jump Fest, Recondo School. Recondo School was funny because after I finished all my training and got to brag, I got kind of big. It's like, you know, they say the 10 pounds of freshman year of college. Right. Mine was about 20 pounds of not having to do really hard PT every day. And yeah. uh, when I went to Recondo School, it was just a treat. You know, also when I went to jump school, remember, we still had blue stripes and blue name tags. So you couldn't hide Oh yeah. Anywhere. You stood um, out. But, but the Marines in my class, anybody that was in a different service, if they dropped one service, all of us would get down and do our push ups together. So that, that jointness formed even in the beginning at Fort Bend. Nice. And you guys I still went, wore uh, jump boots at, during yeah. when you did PT and all that stuff, right? They they had transitioned out of that um, before I went. But yeah, and I remember back in the day you guys were running in boots and it was a little tougher yeah. than it is now, I think. We didn't run in like the Cochrane jump boots, your dress boots, but you definitely ran in your issue boots. I mean, right, right. all of Fort Benning was that way. Recondo school was that way. When we ran from Fort Bragg, I think you know that. There was a relay we did from Fort Bragg down to Shaw. We would run in formation. Yeah. Um, we'd do five mile legs a piece and, and then bundle yeah. up again as a unit when we got down there. And that was just a, a wild adventure of buffoonery as well. Um, and then Shaw would run back to us, you know, a couple of years later. And then yeah. we, we did it twice. And then that kind of became a safety hazard because we were running along the side of the road from Fort Bragg to Shaw. Uh, but definitely good times. Um, well, I think, tell, you know, tell me about then, Recondo School. I'm not, oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I, go ahead. I'm not that familiar with um, Recondo School. Do you, do you, like, can you tell me a little bit about it? Like maybe what you guys did in that school? Yeah, I think it, it was like a, a wannabe low, uh, it even had a tab, you even oh, okay. wore a, a Recondo tab, which would 
you'd probably get shamed out of the universe if you wore it today. Right. Um, nobody was getting ranger school and stuff like that back then. So our unit, I like to say attack P is getting somebody to a want you there when they don't need you when they don't think they need you right. and then perform well enough for you that they become a really good part of the team. So we got right. recondo school just by that, just by, we used to do PT with our army units on their Friday long runs, you know, right there with them. And they saw that we could keep up. They saw that we could lead. Uh, and so they offered us recondo as two weeks of basically pre ranger kind of stuff. You know, oh, okay. you're doing the rope and tagging and the off school courses and land nav and shooting, patrolling, all those types of things. Oh, okay. Um, it was neat because I was in there for Easter and I remember them having us putting our hands on our feet and hopping like bunnies in the hand to hand pit, <laughs> you know, um, and it was also back when they, the military was still using goats for a lot of things. So uh -huh. our particular team, we were the first ones back. We had done something well and we were going to get to kill a goat and eat it because we hadn't eaten well in a few days. Sure. So you had a K-bar knife and I got the chance to be the one to kill the goat. What I found oh, really? out is, is that goat nearly killed me. I mean, all the things you learn on TV about you're going to hit somebody and they're going to fall down or you're going to shoot them and they're just going to instantly die. Mm -hmm. Well, when I jumped on that goat, first off, I was trying not to cut my arm off because that goat was not going along. And I was bruised all over by the time that goat died and bled out. <laughs> It would oh have been gosh. a wonderful video, and I'm glad it didn't exist. Um, <laughs> but when I got out of Recondo school, we hadn't cleaned weapons much at all. And what they gave me as a reward was somebody else had to clean my weapon to get it back into the arms room. Because nice. you've got the suppressor on it, and it's just claw. It was just nasty. So that oh, was yeah, my yeah. reward for finishing Recondo school is having someone else clean my weapon. Hey, that's a good one. Yeah. You know, uh, considering how uh, sticklers the armorer can be, you know, like yeah. they get in there with a Q-tip and it's like, nope, it's still dirty. Go back and, clean, you know, so that's yeah. pretty good. <laughs> yeah, good times. Uh, there's yeah. a, I found a picture of our graduating class, which was pretty funny. The other person that in it that went with me, his name's Gene Chan. He was in the first TACP course, or the first ROMAD course. Okay. And he was from New Jersey and we were we were just figuring out things as we go because we didn't do a lot of good training like that like we do in the school now i mean that right. was all news to us um but yeah you were just starting map. out yeah. yeah the only okay. map and compass we got when i was in school was possibly fairchild for survival school oh, okay you know, so okay so you were at the at debt one uh, did you stay at debt one until it became the 14th or was that did it come the 14th, 14th way after when that? i came back that was way oh, later okay so where'd you go after debt one? What what happened? Uh, Schoolhouse. Um, okay. Went down to the school and I was digging through awards and I saw that I was on the team that created the first TAC P competition. Oh, right on. So I think that was like 83 ish. I got an achievement award for that. I'd forgotten about that. Um, I went down to teach in the schoolhouse. John Culberson was the NCOIC in charge and then we had the Agos school to where people would come down and um, that's when the school was stood up as a detachment from air training command right okay and uh, that didn't last very long there was a lot of tension between me and and some of the leadership and Lauren Thurman one of our other legends who set up the career field and a guy named Sergeant Humphreys, who used to be an A1E pilot in Vietnam, was down at the Air Ground Operations School. So after about a year and a half, I transitioned and became an instructor down there. Oh, okay. Um, and ran the jump program for everyone, because a lot of us had a jump opportunity to keep our wings down there. So uh, I had nice. 60 parachutes and all the planes I could get. And so oh, that's we awesome. just jumped a lot. Um that was a big transition. That's when H.R. Williams was an instructor, Chip Burgess. Uh, you know, we were trying to do our own quasi survival training out, you know, towards Pensacola. Um, it was definitely ad hoc and a do it yourself kind of thing because we just didn't 
have anything else and it's just amazing to see how it's grown but in the beginning yeah. it just a lot of pt um what would be considered harassment today <laughs> right. you'd probably get kicked out for um but I think I started with around 20 people in our class, and it looks like by my order, six of us finished. Oh, wow. So. But that's a testament to you guys that came out of it. And, and man, you're just, just such hard chargers, you know, just like I think it really um, made you, you know, the be- better leaders, faster leaders, because you, you had to kind of come up with all that stuff on your own. You know, like there was no, you know, like you, you were at the very beginning of all that stuff. So you had to like, come up with lesson plans and figure out what you needed to do. And yeah, it was very, yeah, you were, yeah, there was no framework. Commendable. Yeah, there was no framework. And, you know, we used to have our own C4 and would do <laughs> ambushes on Jeep convoys. And sometimes you'd kind of get confused and put the larger block too close to the vehicles. And, <laughs> um, but it, we, Chief Petty John was down there when I was there too. I don't know if you know him. He was, a I heard the name. Yeah. Chief was just, he was part, you know, we grew up in the career field that if you weren't airborne, then you you were just worthless. And there was a lot of energy wasted on that. And during the yeah. first Gulf War, everybody, you know, that was in special ops or airborne thought, oh, this is going to be horrible. These armor guys can't do anything. And, you know, they did outstanding and they did yeah. very well. And it was just a reminder that we all are in our swim lane. Don't, it makes you feel, you know, you like to be arrogant, but in hindsight, that was wasted energy. For sure. You know, uh, yeah. The career field as a whole has done extremely well when called on. Oh, for sure. And, uh, but good times nonetheless. Yeah. And after that, I got the chance to say, Hey, do you want to go to Panama? I said, sure. So what it was 78 to 82 at the school at Fort Bragg. And then it was 82 to 86 and Hurlburt. And then 86, I went down to Panama um, you know, we had the air, the special forces battalion on the Cologne side, the airborne battalion on the other. That was a wonderful time. You know, you, you learned a lot about what not to bring in the field. You know, they used to issue you a large Alice pack, a medium Alice pack and a small. And if you ever tried to, you know, the Sergeant major is a Sergeant major Lamica. He ended up being pretty famous in the Ranger world. He would take all your rucks and throw them aside and give you only the medium. And then he would make you put your radios and batteries in it. And then he would put your, put your water in it. And if you have room for anything else, you can bring it. But he said, all he saw was people being heat casualties in Panama because they had too much weight, you know, and you'd right. parachute in out there and you'd already be dehydrated just from sitting on the ramp at Howard air <laughs> force base before you got on the plane, much right. less humping around in it. So the PT was good. The, we were starting to get a little more formal. Ray Carvalho is in charge. Him and HR were at the wing trying to have a stand of program that was really good. Um, that was a, you could see the formation of more rigor and more standard and processes. Uh, when I was down there, I was lucky enough to be selected as the, what did my plaque say? Romat of the year in 1986. Um, okay that led to one of the outstanding airmen of the air force off of right on as well um, nice got to travel all over the place good times and and when i left panama the cool thing was is i came back down for the invasion you know two months after i left because i was in yeah. jcu and then the, then you know urgent fury or ju- just cause the other funny thing there in panama i found a I remember this event, but I didn't realize I had transcripts. On 24 December of 1987, I was arrested along with Ron Plunkett and our wives and kids <laughs> for giving away toys to kids in Panama. We were out at a dive spot we used to go to, and I used to go out there every year and bring them bags of rice and apples and give them toys. They used to carry all of our dive tanks out to the island we'd go dive on. Yeah. And it was leading up to the, to the, what we came down there for the invasion for, but you, there was a rule that outlawed civic action. You couldn't do civic action without a permit. Really? They considered me giving these gifts civic action. And so they separated our wives and my two kids and had me and Ron in a cell and, you know, a lot of cussing and yelling and that we were breaking the law and all this bullshit. Um, Wait, so was it, 
Did the Panamanians arrest you or the yeah. U.S.? Oh, they. Oh my gosh, that's even worse. Well, the, uh, what happened was we were there handing out stuff, and these two officers, you know, Panamanian police came up and said, "Hey, do you guys have a permit?" And we're like, "No, I didn't know we needed a permit." He said, "Well, come on down here to the station, and we'll get you a permit." That didn't work. Out oh so well. man. Um. But when they were like talking to my wife at the time, she spoke a little Spanish. I had the presence of mind. There was a phone booth outside and I walked outside and called the control tower. And the reason I knew the control towers numbers, because my wife at the time was an air traffic controller and I knew they oh. had a recorded line. So I said, Hey, this is here. I, who I am. This is who's with me. We're being detained by the Panamanian police and they transferred me to a command post, all that. Anyway, long story short, um, government liaisons finally got to us. We'd gone to, cologne we'd gone to fort gulick they'd moved us from place to place yeah. because if they kept moving you they didn't have to report to the u.s that they had you oh uh. so we got out of i don't know late christmas eve night early christmas morning and the base commander uh had master keys as, as we got back and the police brought us back to base at Howard. He's like, well, what can I do for you? And I said, well, I got some little tyke stuff I got to put together for Christmas in the morning. And he said, you want a beer? And he had a key and opened up the class six store. We got a 12 pack, <laughs> went and sat on my back patio and base housing and put our little tyke stuff up. So when the kids got up there, there was their presence. Oh but man, you guys met just in time. When, yeah. When I won the award that let me go back to DC, that, it was about four of us, um, not from Panama, but four TAC P's. It was Armstrong, Mabry, me, and uh, the other guy's name will come to me. He died of a brain tumor not long ago. But anyway, going to see your congressman and the public affairs person said, hey, don't let's not talk about what happened to you at Christmas Eve. And I'm like, check. <laughs> Except my grandmother knew, and my grandmother knew my congressman. So as soon as we walked in the door, he's like, hey, Doug, tell me about what happened in Panama. Uh, you know, <laughs> And th they said, hey, is there anything I can do for you? And I said, yeah, I'd like to not be there for another Christmas. And so they dropped my departure from January to October. And then I went back down for the invasion because of that. But they allowed my orders to get out. And when I left there, I went to Joint Communications Unit, right? Uh -huh. So the leaders that were there before me were people like Dan Gilliam. Um, I think Clay and I got there. Clay Christian and I got there at the same time. Randy Long, okay. Plunkett, Klebe, all, all of us had a rotation through JCU and it was really yeah. neat. And if you don't know what JCU was, it was, you were either part of the hostage rescue teams or you were part of uh, comms for different deployed units liaison to the special operations command so yeah you'd have 13 suitcases of different satellite comms but when i went up there you had to do a run around pope it was a six mile run you had to do you had to do a 10 mile march you had to do all these little tests but i had broken my ankle torn the ligaments of my ankle about six weeks before that and so i cut my cast off before i got up there because if i couldn't do the pt i wasn't going to know if i was going to get selected sure and i did okay but i remember those little cuckaburr i stepped on one at the end and oh. just rolled it but i had already done the run i'd already done the ruck and everything Good. else was this interview but it but anyway that's how i got to that unit and and the way i got back to panama in JCU, you would also fly on, we had these kits that we could go on any plane and, and remove a hatch and put an antenna that was unique to the unit in the, in the plane. Okay. And I was flying the med ready, the evacuation bird. So I would pick up special operators and at the time. It was mostly the seals who were getting shot. And as they stabilized, we'd take them and put them in a C-141 and fly to San Antonio get them out then that plane would fly back to bragg to get new special operators or gear or whatever and then fly back so that was my rotation the first few days of that that battle wow um it's interesting time that is yeah that's so cool yeah i, I knew all those names you were super heavy hitters um but i never really knew exactly what you guys did at jcu so it's i'm glad to hear 
a little insight on what what went on up there. I know you guys did some really cool stuff. They but had I just never uh, got any details. Yeah, you did urban warfare. You did. You had orders, and I have them. They're pretty cool. It was a blanket order. You didn't. You had no grooming standards. You didn't have to wear a uniform. You could carry a weapon anywhere. You had multiple passports for various reasons. Yeah. Usually a lot of cash. That's and awesome. one of the cooler assignments, you, we did two month rotations in Germany and Frankfurt, working for various agencies there. And we flew a special aircraft. And but that's all you did for two months was just fly two days a week and do PT and live Germany. I mean, I saw the Rolling <laughs> Stones in Germany. I saw, oh, no. yeah, <laughs> I bungee jumped the first time. And and Frank, I mean, it was just a wonderful, wonderful time. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, that JCU, you either had a tactical jeep if you were going out in your normal field ops. But a lot of what you did was urban and. Uh, more clandestine type of work. Good okay. Time. So when you got down, when you uh, went down there for the invasion, um, just that rotation, like when you went in, did you land at uh, one of the airports that the guys had seized? And then at Howard, they would... we landed at Howard. Okay. Yeah. And, and then... they, they had already brought the casualties back to you to put yeah. on and okay. So everything was kind of unique. Then the, the joint medical augmentation unit is the term they use was a unit maintained from within that JSOC community. So right. the SEALs and the Rangers would be brought to that JMU if they weren't hospitalized and flown out right away. Mm -hmm. uh, the ones I flew with and set by were guys who were like shot in the ass or the back of the leg, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they were just going to get better treatment in the States. And then I became the liaison that was working downtown with the, uh, it's not General Steiner can't remember the general's name that was in charge but basically as all the different units were trying to find noriega i was there in that headquarters um and just relaying all the, all the different comms back I, I, i'm sure you're familiar i mean there's so many different nets and we had all the yeah. different nets up so you were being able to hear every unit all the time oh that's what so i was gonna say you probably happen. were like had all the information. You probably heard everything that was going on. That would be such a unique Yeah, the big clue was when they would call, get on a net and ask everyone to get off. No one would get off. <laughs> right. yeah, you'd just go on mute. Um, but that was good times. And it was kind of yeah. odd to go into a place that you had just lived three years. So I had local contacts towards the end of it when everything had died down that would bring us rum or beer or whatever. And yeah. you know, my, my liaison army liaison guy I was with, he goes, where are you getting this alcohol? And it's like, man, <laughs> I lived here three years. <laughs> yeah. give, me, give me a break. So when they did, when they did get Noriega, I was the only one on the staff there that had a good bottle of whiskey to have a toast <laughs> for it. And so, right you on. know, the air force provided the, the path once again. So yeah. yeah. Um, so after, after the invasion, did you stay at JCU for a while or did you move on? After yeah, that? I was there for almost three years. And then I went over to Army Special Forces Command. Jack okay. Hogan was there, me, Buddy MacArthur and Gary Jones. And our colonel was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bittner. OK. Um, so basically, that was early days of teaching SF about CAS. Mm -hmm. um, nothing formal about it, but you wanted to understand a nine line. You wanted to understand our gear. We used to go down to Avon Park and Gila Bend and Grayling, Michigan a lot. And we were doing the old school laser designation. Um, we even had a few of the old beacons and do the beacon bombing. And that was a horrible idea. Um, <laughs> You know, in Panama, they were still flying A7s, and right. they were just such a great cast plane, and we had good relations with them, and they liked working with us with the SF. It was a little easier than working with the 82nd or, I imagine, any other Army unit. So we never had a shortage of cast. Nice. And the SF guys were, you know, squared away. They were, you know, pretty humble. Once they knew that you could, you, you always, everything always started with, could you keep up with them? Right, right. You know, and they found out that we could keep up and more. Yeah. Um, and so then they wanted to learn what we could we could teach them. And that was, that was a good gig. And after I think it was a couple of years there is when they decided to merge the jump school into a joint school, which really means 
an army school with a bunch of Air Force, Navy, and Marines in it because right. we were never promoted fast enough to have the rank or time and grade that our army counterparts did. Right. Um, I stood that up with myself, uh, Ron Plunkett. Um, then I had three SEER guys, three pararescue guys, and two combat controllers. Okay. And so we all went through school together, uh, instructor training together there, got certified. Ron Plunkett was the first one certified. And actually, it was a combat controller, Ty Clark, who was the going to be landing on I number 275. And he declined and let Ron get I 275. Nice. Which was kind of neat of him. Yeah, yeah. Ty was pretty heroic guy in combat control um well hold on for those who don't know 275 was our uh when i came in i was a 275 as well it was our um afsc our air force specialty code yeah so yeah that's pretty cool that he charlie four and now you're something else right yeah i don't even know what it is now yeah i got out before they changed to the new one so yeah yeah uh a zulu one zulu i think or something yeah it was neat to have rescue combat control oh we had seer instructors too so we had that was the that made up the cadre Right. Oh, really? We got there and we had a number of fatalities while I was there. Uh, But one of them was Sergeant Major uh, Frank Norberry. And his Mm. dad was retired Sergeant Major Frank Norberry, who had three combat jumps in Vietnam. Wow. And his dad um, got hit the tail of the uh, rear stabilizer of the plane that we went out. It was a DC 3 agency plane Mm -hmm. but he fell perfectly stable because he was unconscious and and dying Uh, but yeah yeah. uh, we did get automatic openers initially we were going to go our own way and just buy them but after the fatality and a lot of near misses we had it was like you know it was the cypress if you're familiar with the cypress automatic opening device it it doesn't make it doesn't misfire you know the old schools would say no you don't want that as an instructor you're going to be head down and your parachute's going to pop open and it's going to kill you but that just wasn't the case right so again it was going into a unit that wasn't sure they wanted you there they didn't like some of the things you brought to the table um but what what won us over there is is we're going to bury sergeant major norbury at arlington and we wanted to get a plane to go there, and the Army couldn't get a plane. And I said, uh, well, I can get a plane. I said, you can. I, we've already tried. So I went over to the base commander at Pope and said, hey, this is who I am. This is where I am. I need a C-130 to take us up. We'll be glad to jump out of it on the way back. You can call it a training mission. Told the unit, yeah, I got us a plane. It's going to pick us up. I got six parachutes on it. We'll jump back in when we get in, and, and we'll get it done. And it's not like they came up and hugged me and thanked me or anything, but from that moment on, we were accepted in a different way. Nice. Uh, one, so once again, Air Force element going into a foreign place, um, show your worth, do your job, bring value, and that's yeah. what we did. Yeah, that's that's like the story of every tech P. If you if you go in there and bring something to the fight or help them in some way, then yeah, you get yeah. received with or at least hang in PT or something. But that's awesome. Well, so then they were going to move the school to Yuma and the whole school was supposed to move. And we had been teaching winter classes in El Centro. Um, and we went out there to transition to U.S. Forest Service from round parachutes to square parachutes. So we went out there and taught uh, hotshot firefighters, you know, how to jump a square chute. And I hadn't been to Yuma, and so we went out there for a site survey. First off, the Army did the genius thing of, if you've ever been to Yuma, the gate's like 30 miles from the main post. They did that (laughs) because if the gate was where the post actually started, it'd be considered a remote assignment, and they'd have to pay people extra. Oh, (laughs) So they just moved the gate. Genius. Um, Yeah. Well, I got out there and said, there's no damn way I'm moving to Yuma. So I convinced that air force that they should let half the people the people that don't want to go not go let the half that want to go go and that way you'd have a staggered departure of people because if we all went out there at once our tours would be over at the same time and you wouldn't have any experience so that was my uh, selfish Mark. justification to get out of moving <laughs> to yuma so i just went out there tdy for the last year and a half 
Nice. Uh, when I finished that uh, 18th A SOG had a group position. Um, I think it said I was in charge of operations and planning or something, just some kind of a group put cush job. Uh, me, Kenny Waterson, Paul Gay Hart, a bunch of other folks. And then, you know, the 14th A sauce is right there on the base. Um, right, right. So just that, that ended up being my last assignment. Um, when I made senior, I, and I, I think it's changed a little bit. I never was a great test taker. When I made senior, my board score was as high as it could be. And, and for me personally, that's the first time you're judged by a body of your peers to, to measure the value of, of the service you provided to the career field and to have such a high board score to overcome my very low uh, <laughs> PME score. Um, right. It felt really good to be selected. Nice. Uh, one of the few things in my office is something that Lunk and the Rangers brought to me and it said, Senior Master Sergeant Select, thanks for the altitude from the Ranger Tac P. And then they did quotes, it'll cost you because anytime I got these guys' planes, it was going to cost them a case of beer or a bottle of whiskey yeah. or something. I don't uh -huh. know. And that I had been hurt um, and I had a great surgeon. I had compression fractures in my neck and my back. Um, interesting how those things happen. Uh, one of them was when I was in JSOC, we were fast roping onto ships doing a hostage rescue on a ship, and it was a night mission going in and you know they send the heaviest person down first for tension on the rope and everybody's coming sure. behind you well the helicopter saw the guide wires and the ship the ship uh sea state was kind of high and it backed up and it made it where the rope wasn't on the ship anymore it was so oh, i came no. off the end of the rope and where i had my ruck that pivot point is what hurt my back bad oh man but i had a surgeon I didn't get surgery. I had a flight surgeon that said he gave me a waiver to only make water jumps for my last year. They didn't board me out or anything. Nice. I'd fly down to Key West and make a jump. But since I didn't, couldn't deploy or couldn't really do anything, I did a master's program every Saturday and Sunday for about 18 months with Central Michigan and got a master's. I had finished my bachelor's after about nine years of night school of dropping and adding classes and uh yeah when i when i got out i, I thought i wanted to go be a long-term care administrator because i figured i was going to be needing long-term care and right. my wife was a nurse but i didn't but during bosnia uh colonel bittner was supposed to go down and talk to texas instruments who had the paveway uh bomb system you know laser guided right. And he asked me to go down there and give them a briefing about why we didn't use more laser guided bombs. It was all around the technology back then. If, if you were in a tree line and the netting was good, you just couldn't see it and you didn't have anything reflective with the type of lasers we were using back then. Right. So I had a stack of cards and after nobody would hire me, I started calling those people. And one of them happened to have been a 304, a radio maintenance guy during Vietnam and he knew what attack P was. And as I talked to him, uh, we found out that our grandmothers had taught us in elementary school. And he looked at me, he said, hey, I know you can lead and think and you understand risk. If you promise me you'll learn software, I'll hire you. So that's 25 years ago this month. I went to uh, Texas Instruments in Dallas right when it was being purchased by Raytheon. I did a core in computer science and, and used Voc Rehab to get a master's in software engineering. Nice. And, uh, that was my foot in the door. Somebody knowing what attack P was, knowing that we could think, knowing that we could make a decision. Because in engineering, if you've worked with much engineers, you can ne never have too much data as an as a engineer. But at right. some point, you've got to make a decision. And I think sure. that's this ingrained in TAC P's. You're, you're making a decision with all the best data you have and you're going to boldly go somewhere. And I'd rather boldly go and find out that I'm wrong than to not move. Right. I mean, sure. And that's yeah, yeah. how I got into, um, Raytheon right now. I lead the Tomahawk development, uh, the Tomahawk cruise missile. Mm-hmm. 
I have about 400 and something people. Uh, I'm a director. And what I've enjoyed is I'm still contributing to the fight. Uh, sure. I've worked the AMRAM cruise missile. I've worked the Excalibur, you know, guided projectile artillery that's come out. And the framework of what we had as a TACP of just providing something and leading and holding yourself accountable and holding others accountable it transitioned well to my career here. I'm about, I'll probably be retiring in the next six months. I figure 46, 47 years is enough. Yeah. That's probably um, pretty good. Yeah. But the, but the TACP world is this, it's the foundation. I mean, I still carry, carry my coin all the time and not that there's anybody to coin check anymore. That even right. a, a real thing, but I don't forget where I came from and the opportunity I was given, you know, we've got a lot of folks dying lately because it's just the age, mm -hmm. you know, Sergeant Brock died, Chief Fiscus died. Um, and that's just the time we are. And I'm glad that the association sends people to represent um, that we're not forgetting them. Um, Definitely. And I, I talk to a number of them all the time just to stay in touch. I said, what was it about you? Why didn't you send me to jail instead of sending me for airman of the year? You know, and he goes, nah, we we're just all kids. You know, yeah. you did what you were supposed to do when you were supposed to do it. And you can't expect people to, you know, be ready to fight a fight. And, you know, I was in a relative peacetime compared to all the heroics that you guys did for the 20 years of the, you know, war you fought from, you know, me getting out in 98. I just kind of missed it all. Um, yeah. But I think we, we provided a foundation for a lot of people to carry on and y'all brought it forward really well. So I'm just oh, proud for to sure. be associated with it. Your, your, the foundation you guys set for us was invaluable. I mean, it, it's and you, like you said, and we kind of talked about in, in previous um, shows, but just that ability to, for critical thinking is, uh, you know, paramount with it, getting out and getting a job on the outside and, you know, just they, I don't think employers, unless, like you said, unless they know what we do, unless they know our background, it's kind of hard to to transfer that over. That's why they're kind of getting a tap, good task program. But what I was going to mention is um, that's got to be fascinating because you, you used to be on the other side where you were launching all these weapons and you were, you know, you're seeing them detonate. But it's got to be fascinating, like seeing how they're all developed and, you know, what the yeah. process of, you know, like a tomahawk. We just say, oh, yeah, it just shoots off from the boat and just get, goes a, ha a long way and blows something up. But you see the kind of the cradle to grave, yeah. uh, you know, process of it. It's got to be fascinating. Well, if you look back, tomahawk cruise missiles have been what's prepped the battlefield for every conflict we've been in. Right. For my time all the way to now, you know. Um, I understand the thousand dollar toilet seat now. Uh, you know, they used to make fun <laughs> right. of in the news and it's because you've got this drawing description of, of what something's made up of. And if somebody decides to change something, it changes all those drawings. Uh, yeah. it, it, it makes sense. But I'll tell you one thing I did. There's only two things hanging up in my office. One of them is uh, my TACP crest and the others, my jump wings. I don't allude to rank or anything. So people know I'm military. But there still is, a, uh, until you prove yourself again, like you had to as a TAC P. Sure. I mean, I've had colonels work for me, uh, work side by side with retired generals, and they just had no idea I was just a senior NCO. And I, I never wanted to, I wanted them to have to judge me by what my work was. Uh, right. When I got to Raytheon, the very first goals I had to do are Texas Instruments. I didn't know what to put. So I said, you know, I'll meet my commitments. And my boss said, wow, are you really sure you want to meet all your commitments? And I'm like, <laughs> I came home and told my wife, I said, you know, if, if just doing what I say I'm going to do is considered a high bar, I think we're going to be fine here. Yeah, and, for sure. But it that, is, that's that, a weird thing though, that, uh, like you alluded to, like doing well outside of the military is almost kind of easy, especially nowadays. I mean, it's even gotten worse now, but they're kind of like, they, they have a lot more leniency and they're like, Oh, don't worry about it. If you screw something up or if you didn't meet your, you know, meet your goals, or it seems, uh, they're a little too, a little too laxed, a little too forgiving for in that regard, you know, don't you think? Yeah. I teach a course. I'm one of the leadership uh, instructors that teach the program managers for Raytheon. 
and attention to detail and personal warranty. You know, you, you change it from your vernacular. I have, I have nearly zero stories that I relate from my military experience in that environment because I don't want to be put into a box. Sure. Right? Um, over time, people who know me will know my background, but, but most don't. Uh, right. But that, that same thing, if we would say it different in the TACP world or in the military, but your personal warranty is just, are you, are you standing behind what it is you've done, whether it's a sort a line of software or an inspection or the assembly of something, right. are you standing behind it yourself? Um, and then the attention, the detail, I mean, it's just really complex. And when you're dealing with a weapon system, much like if you, you know, why do we kick people out of jump master school when they just miss one major? Well, cause that yeah. one major, uh, is enough to, to just ruin you. You know, you, you sure. can't miss it. Right. And teaching that it's agnostic to whether you're a TACP or in the military or not. If you can get somebody to have a personal warranty, know that that's their uh, contribution and that attention to detail, it, it crosses over into everything. Yeah. You know, I led scouting for a number of years. My son's an Eagle Scout and um, I had a retired colonel that was there, uh, just a, a wonderful man. He said, Doug, you got to love scouting more for your son than you can disdain the parents. I said, okay. And he said, uh, and if you lead hiking and backpacking, most of the ones that will annoy you won't be there. So for 10 right. years, I led the <laughs> right. hiking and backpacking element of it. And just the things we learn in the service. Um, and, and actually I learned them as a kid, you know, my, my dad, yeah. you put things away, you clean things, everything right. had a place. Yeah, uh, yeah. Maybe that, you know, I think general Steiner used to say he used to love, we need more country boys because country boys will recognize that pile of dirt should not be there or somebody has turned that grass. Uh, so right. I feel like even my upbringing brought me to a good place to be in the tap yeah. fee and uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah. So did you want to talk a little bit about, we kind of talked about it before about the, uh, the 24 hour uh, challenge that the tech bees do and the tech bee association. Yeah. You know, the, the association has just grown so much, you know, I mean, before I found one of the things I found when I was just trying to get ready for this was uh, the original TACP association and I was TACP number nine on it. Yeah. And my original TACP oh my coin, by the way, was number 69 because I couldn't get, I didn't want to be 275 <laughs> and I couldn't be number one or two. So I just jumped down to number 69 because <laughs> you know for various reasons you might imagine right right um, yeah. but i think the way the career field has come together it has been impressive so i had participated you know previously but during covid i had the idea you know they were saying they weren't going to have it but they still needed money so i got hold of folks and said hey we used to have a, a an ultra option it could be the unit or it could be an individual mm -hmm. and i said how about if i run 60 miles i'll raise six thousand dollars and it happened to be my 60th birthday wow and uh so i live in tucson arizona and uh there's a loop that goes around the, the town so i ran from my house parked my truck down there and had my resupply stuff there and just did 10 mile legs out and back until I did the 60 miles and ended up getting like $6,800 for the association. That nice. was the year I think uh, Jared gave, you know, I don't know, a million dollars or a right. hundred million dollars, some, some humongous amount of crazy, money crazy Ross amount. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> it was my part. Um, Brian Daly was one of our instructors uh, at Free Fall School. I recruited him. He had been in Ranger Battalion with Marty Klukas, and he died in a night free fall jump. And the way the association as a whole has stayed in touch with, you know, his wife and his daughter, and they've done the same thing for other people. It's just something I'm very comfortable and proud to be a part of. So it's Definitely. something I, I, I keep on my mind and uh, hope that continues to go. So Definitely. That's yeah, those guys, it. It, it, the way it's grown to be something to, like you said, to take care of guys and their families and, and not and just basically not forget about these guys. You know, there's yeah. a lot of a lot of guys that have passed that, you know, sometimes we 
get caught up in our own lives. And it's nice to see that little reminder on Facebook or or what or get an email or somebody posts some or texts you and say, hey, we're do, we're doing a toast on about for this guy. And yeah. it's really good to, that we're keeping their memory alive. I think that they're doing a great thing with that for sure. Well, I was glad they're supporting the living because you know I think you guys that were deployed for 20 straight years, a lot more opioid type addiction and pain medication addiction that you know nobody saw coming for us it was you know 500 count 800 milligram ranger candy everybody had a a box of it you know and our livers may be quasi shot but the fact that we're helping people across the spectrum you know i see people that are in despair and they'll make that call out in a minute you know there's a phone tree going on and somebody's finding them who lives near them who can help them Um, that's a wonderful thing for sure so yeah that's a good point. Like there guys are dealing with PTSD or like you said, addiction or anything at all. And, um, uh, yeah, it's just a phone call away. And that's, I guess that's a good thing to say to people who are watching this. If you are struggling with that kind of stuff, there, as there's a ton of us out here that will, you know, have no problem linking up with you or talking to you or, you know, give, getting you help in some way. So yeah, just yeah. reach out. Don't feel like you're alone by any means. Yeah. yeah. The resources I've seen brought to bear really quickly have just been very impressive and, uh, for sure. And it's generational. I'm starting to not know any of the names. I think I, after I was out like 10 or 15 years, I never recognized anybody on the promotion list. But right. And now the career field's going through a new thing. You know, they're downsizing again. So it's going to be a different, a different time. And we've got to uh, maintain the presence that we can for them, you know, until the next time comes and they need a lot more of them than they have. And uh, we'll build it up again. Right. But JD, I appreciate you reaching out. Uh, I know Marty no, and this... Jay Mack are the ones that told me that uh, you might be reaching out. It's it's been a great trip down memory lane for me. Um, yes, sir. For me too. I it, it, like I said, we didn't. I don't think we crossed paths uh, that much, if at all, when we were when I was in. Um, but your name has been synonymous with, you know, jumping and and uh, and leadership and uh, excellence. So I I really appreciate you coming on here and, and yeah. telling us your story. It was fascinating. I loved it every minute of it. No problem, man. I appreciate it. Okay. Well, take care. And all right, man. Thanks yeah. a lot.